mistakes. Uh, uh, today we have government to have a very nice talk by um, an uh, The talk title is towards more practical reinforcement learning frameworks through efficient use of data and experts. Um, and Imesh Garg is CFR Chair Assistant Professor of Computer Science and Mechanical Engineering at the University of Toronto, a faculty member at the Vector Institute and um, University of Texas Robotics Institute, where he leads the Toronto People, AI and Robotics of Pair Research Group. Uh, Animesh is also a senior researcher in video research. Animesh is from the PhD from UC Berkeley and was a postdoc at the Stanford AI Lab. Uh, his work aims to build generalizable autonomy, which involves a confluence of representations and algorithms for reinforcement learning, control, and perception. In particular, he is currently studies three aspects, learning structured inductive biases and sequential decision making, using data-driven causal discovery, and transfer to real robots, all in the pursuit of embedded systems. His work has received AAI new faculty highlight and best paper recognitions to top tier venues in machine learning and robotics, such as ICRA, IRS, RSS, Emlyn Symposium, workshops at Europe, ICML, has been widely covered in the print New York Times, Nature, Wired, I Triple E Spectrum. That is. <laughs> Thank you, and that was quite a mouthful. I'm so sorry. I should have optimized for quick info. I think. Thank you, first of all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for inviting me, and and I'm genuinely um, wondered and, and honored to be here. Uh, I am Animesh, I am currently at Toronto, and I split my time between Toronto and West Coast, actually. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a number of recent works primarily focusing on reinforcement learning, as Alex requested. Uh, broadly, the group works on a number of interesting topics, particularly in 3D vision, video prediction, and causality. But I think today's talk would focus on, on RL uh, primarily. I planned for a 50 minute talk. I did not plan for traffic though. So I'm so sorry. I hope uh, some of you can stay longer. If time permits, uh, I, I definitely will be able to stick around uh, or um, I'll, I'll sort of play it by the year and then skip some sections. And actually I would love to be able to discuss and find uh, interesting points of overlap. Okay, so let's get started. As a roboticist, one of the things that I would like to work on always is things that work. Uh, and and uh, one of the dreams that I have had is what would make robots uh, viable enough to actually just bring one home. Uh, and, and what would it take? Uh, what would it take to build a robot that would just work out of the box? Currently, nothing does. There is no technology that would do that. And and. These systems, and again, I'm going to use Kitchen as an example, primarily because everybody relates to Kitchen, not because Kitchen is particularly special. Uh, for something like building a robot at home, you need something that can do multitude of tasks, right? So maybe cleaning, cooking, laundry, any sort of task. And all of these things need to work with some sort of generalization that you may not be able to plan for always. Sometimes it may need to solve problems that are slightly longer term in terms of time. These are not things that you had, again, planned for at the time of building the system. Now, if we talk about robot hardware, particularly in mobile manipulators, one could argue that we've made a lot of progress. Uh, this is a video from last year at Boston Dynamics. And, uh, and then as we've seen really um, from across the board, we see impressive results on what I would say control. Put the same robot to work. Turns out, uh, building real robots in the real world with real perception is, well, really hard. Uh, so what, what is the problem? And I would argue the problem is what I would call algorithmic generalization. I will define what generalization means in, in the setup. But in this particular setting, this generalization could be to new objects, new scenes, new semantics, new task goals. Now. One way to think about autonomy can be either you can do domain expertise. So 
one, one part of the solution is this is how we have done robotics so far. Structured environment, one problem, one solution. Domain expert comes in, they code up the, the framework with uh, a structured system, maybe perception planning control boxes, so on and so forth. Now, of late, on the other hand, we have seen this, this argument, it's like, all we need is just scale, it's game over, right? Uh, so, uh, it, feels, it feels that the data and the scale is, is super effective. One could argue neither of these approaches are actually working, right? What you need is, both of these problems, these have certain problems, right? Either you need too much expertise or, or this is sort of overfit. The other one is just computational sustainability. You don't even know how much data you need. You don't know what would work out of distribution. It's very hard to quantify that formally to begin with. And this is where a lot of my, what I would say, intuition or philosophy of research comes in. I argue that neither is sufficient. You need what, I, what you would call inductive biases uh, to learn these things. Data is not sufficient, actually. It doesn't matter how much of it you have in, in cases. And, and this is not something that we have just realized, by the way, right? This is something that has been told to us by philosophers, psychology, machine learning, early 90s. Deep learning is, by the way, working because parts of the biases, right? Now, the question that we want to study is, First of all, we need to convince ourselves there is no generalization without structure. And there is no super general purpose structure either. Right? Uh, so there is no sort of like magic in a sense. So then if we agree to that argument, then one could argue that what we are really after is a mechanism to build the right inductive biases or structure. And the structure can be domain knowledge, symmetries, prior, so on and so forth, and data. So it's not that scale or data is just the only thing you need, it's only one of the things you need, and you need to really figure out how are you going to use online and offline data, how are you going to use simulation and real data, labeled and self-supervised data, do you need human in the loop, how do you do transfer, and all of these things are very important problems in this space. Now, if you really think about this, uh, uh, this framework, it's not surprising that people in language and vision have made a lot of progress. It's basically based on data and compute, right? Data plus compute results in well, profit. <laughs> uh, and, and one could argue that modern machine learning is built of essentially these three things, large structured models, large data sets, and distributed training and deployment. The interesting thing is, in almost all of these cases, uh, we are doing passive offline decision making. Robots are slightly different. Why? It's embodied. In a sense, what is happening is, well, you can break a lot of these assumptions. Right? You may not have structured data. Uh, you definitely don't necessarily have what you would call large-scale deployment. Robots need, don't need large-scale deployment right now, in a sense of like large-scale compute, in a, in a sense. Now, if you go back again to draw inspiration from computational neuroscience, Folks like Daniel Wolpert have argued that intelligence exists to serve motion. The notion of intelligence or studying intelligence ideally purely for vision and language is actually just not a thing, at least not in nature. Right? The whole framework of intelligence exists to serve movement, which makes, in a sense, robotics the central problem of intelligence. And that's what we work on. We basically work on understanding reasoning and control for embodied system and embodied is the key word here. The way I would argue about this is there are only two parts of the problem to think about. One, how do you specify a task? How do I tell a system to do something? And, and what does that algorithm look like with some sort of input? The input can be images, language, uh, show and tell, some sort of supervision comes through for task specification and then you need to complete that task in that data scar setup, right? And then we need another set of algorithms that allow you to do generalization to new tasks, new variations, new environments, right? So this is an example. You teach a system to build one chair and then it should learn the concept of a chair so that it can build new chairs. And, and I argue that this framework again requires three aspects of research questions. One, what sort of structure do we need for decision-making? How are we going to discover the structure from data? And finally, as we are roboticists, we would like to do some sort of deployment. What would that question be? Much of my research 
currently is structured around these three questions. When I say structure, I basically mean representations, but for decision making. We are not. We thought about decision uh, structures for vision, like CNNs or transformers for language or sequential decision making. But if you look at deep RL, deep RL isn't really all that deep. Uh, it's MLPs. Right? Uh, how do you discover that structure from causality? And finally, transfer and safety. For today's talk, I'll focus only on the first part of the talk uh, in the structure. That's where majority of the work we do in reinforcement learning comes in. However, I would be very open to meet you after this talk or even just offline after that uh, to talk about all of the other work we have been doing. So let's get started. When we talk about structured representations in vision, there's a bunch of different frameworks that we have started using. And sometimes in combination, you can say that we use relational inductive biases, uh, which are basically built into the architecture. Uh, we use attention mechanisms. Uh, we use these transfer learning mechanisms, which are which are which show up in losses, contrastive losses. And a combination of these things are, are what you would say powering machine learning these days. Now let's look at reinforcement learning. I would argue that most of you are fairly aware and and I don't need to teach you reinforcement learning. This is more of a well refresher. What is a reinforcement learning problem? There is some sort of input. Let's say in the context of a robot, that input can be state, maybe images. There is some sort of agent. Let's say your agent is some MLP. There is some update rule, and uh, the output is maybe torque, maybe some other action space. And then because there is a system, you must have what you would call a latent reward system. Uh, the environment gives you reward, or maybe you have coded a reward that uses, let's say, information that would require access to privileged uh, sensing. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what this has enabled so far is, well, what you'd say, structured settings, like specific tasks. Uh, slow learning takes days and, and fairly narrow. This doesn't like really generalize, generalize. Now I would argue, yeah, but there are multitask RL, meta learning and all that. But if you lo look at like their experiment section, uh, not their introduction, uh, you'd, you'd be surprised that like how limited they are. Now you compare that to anything, anything, let's say biological, whether it's babies or animals, they're surprisingly fast. Right. One could argue that they're fast because they're using the right inductive biases. Uh, and they're broad, again, because algorithmically there's something different that we're missing. So the question basically is, what is the structure bias for decision making? Right. How are you going to find that? So let's actually look at what RL is slightly in deep, right? not just like at the, at the very high level. So let's say you have an observation. The first thing you will do is, maybe some sort of processing. You will actually process the uh, observation into some sort of state. Let's call that state abstract, right? It doesn't need to be very specific. It can be latent. It can be, it can be outputs of state estimations, by the way. It doesn't matter. Now, you pass this state in to a policy, and that would be what your sort of policy would output some sort of action abstraction that you decode into control. Control for robots can be torque. Control for cars can be slightly different. But the magic happens in this orange box, right? It's not just that, actually. There are a few other things. There is a transition model and a value function. And algorithms which use transition model and value functions can be trained as with some sort of update rules. And uh, different variants can be called planning or learning, depending on what are you using, right? The interesting thing is, where does the deep RL, where does the deep here go? Like, and then when, once you start thinking about this, my argument is deep can be interesting in each of the boxes that I'm going to show you today. Right? It can be in the value, the transition model, the policy, the action decoder, the perception, the reward computation, or the update. Right? Uh, let's start looking with one mechanism of solving this problem. This problem can be solved in many ways, model-based, model-free. Even within model-free, you can do a variety of things. Let's look at one of them first. Let's do what we what is called off policy RL. What is off policy RL? Off policy RL basically says there is an agent which interacts with the world. Let's call this behaving agent. This is what we collect data with. This data is then sampled to pass through some data rule. Let's call that TDRR. It can be anything. But for now, let's say it's TDRR. 
this update rule trains your new policy and and then you sort of iterate right now the question is let's ask interesting questions of first where is this data coming from can we use this data more efficiently so let's talk about question one in robotics in general large scale data has been a problem and as we as i did mention that large scale data is the thing that well powers learning right language or 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 otherwise now robot learning isn't really large scale in a sense definitely not in manipulation autonomous driving has scaled right and it's not for the lack of trying by the way people have tried forever it's just that collecting data in that space is very hard and definitely using data across tasks is is even harder right so it's not even clear if i collect a lot of data how will i use it elsewhere uh, and and one could argue that increasingly as you're trying to do tasks that are well not simple let's say you're going to go beyond grasping or or one one shot task the data set that you have access to is increasingly getting smaller on the contrary what we have seen is we need the other way around the harder the task the more data you should need how do we get something like that we need data that has what you would call diversity of solutions sometimes dexterity of the solutions and will scale in all of the other cases data is used uh, with crowdsourcing but crowdsourcing in robotics has not yet been possible mostly because data is not labeled data needs to be demonstrated so this is what we've built we call the system roboturk which the interesting thing is the novelty is not that oh we can do teleoperation many people have shown teleoperation the novelty is in building a framework where teleoperation can be done without the need for any special device you can basically download an app and uh move on with that right so let me show you this framework works not just here but essentially anybody can download an app the th system that you're controlling can be real or simulated you do not need any 3d vr or any game any any specific things anybody in kansas or thailand can just download this and do interesting manipulation tasks off the bat with about five minutes of training the system is robust enough that it works at arbitrary places here i am in the swiss alps with a 2g connection and uh, my friend was in macau i believe and we were both connecting connected to robots in stanford so like this is uh, using your yeah. phone yeah so we have created the system all you need is uh, 2g or 3g level data uh, you don't even need 5g uh, um, so so that's it right. so phone and some screen there's no local compute so you just need one screen it can be an ipad it doesn't need to be a laptop nothing is running locally to begin with uh uh yes go ahead question yeah, i just wanted to ask like so then using this app you're just tell you operating a rem uh, remote remotely and yes so uh, i'm curious like how you like um, how this is going to like scale up right like so a lot of people are going to like operate a single robot on a single task like so we have uh, systems for queuing and handshakes uh, so that if if you have think of the, think of this as uh, how people have implemented gaming like stadia mm -hmm. where there's a gaming server and multiple players so people can queue up can get queued up on both sides you can if you have more robots than people then robots get queued up if there are more people than robots then people get queued up I guess my question around scaling up was around like different environments and different like related tasks. So like com coming back to your first video about the boss retirement part. So over here you have just like one robot that you are remotely manipulating for that one particular task. But at least that's what it seems. But I'm guessing you go. So what I'm not showing you here is we started out with pure manipulation, but now you can do it with mobile manipulation. Uh, and and even if I think the initial idea of, of this particular work was primarily focusing on the ability for people to do tasks which rl cannot do right now and there are many of them right even even doing like three to five step assembly is right now not possible with rl uh, uh, and and as soon as you introduce dexterity in the problem or multimodality in the problem space uh, i don't know of general purpose solutions that work uh, so the idea was that if you can allow people to do this 
with some sort of shared autonomy, they can actually go very far before a fully autonomous solution kicks in. Before this, you say you want to have a low power down to, is it only for peaking task or? No, no, I think, I think I was trying to show you, I think people were trying to do folding cloths or, or that one was just like cleaning up. So finding random stuff in, in very, very sort of high level of garbage. Uh, I'm not describing the task. So if anything falls out of that basket, it's a failure. Uh, so algorithmically, you cannot solve it yet. That's a problem that we have not solved yet. Uh, uh, so uh, you're given like an arbitrary task. So I think for now, we, we can solve things like packing, for example, Amazon style packing. Uh, we can solve, uh, I wouldn't say we can do very fine grained, at least at this point of time, in public information, we cannot do fine grain manipulation. We have internal systems where we now have updated the interface to actually not even use the phone. Uh, just hands. Gloves? Or no, anything? just hands. Just hands. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, so, so we are working on those kind of things that I'll, I'll probably not get to today. Uh, but interfaces are, are improving. That's, that's all I can say right now. I see. Uh, is, but, like, yeah, is this kind of like tidy operation? common in the academic or industry or is like something very, very new? So I would say in academia, yes, it's common. In industry, people try this as the primary mechanism. It doesn't work as well because if you need people in the loop all the time and you're paying them, uh, why bother having robots in the loop at all? One argument can be that the, the expert can be in a, in a location where workers are not available. Let's say if, if uh, the warehouse is in, San Francisco, but the workers are in Kansas, right? Uh, that might work very well. Uh, it had mixed success. What I know of from the information that is publicly available, there are sufficient number of companies that have humans in the loop. So they do teleoperation, but they are not purely teleoperated. So the system requires human in the loop because there's sufficient errors that you would the system would not be deployable without human in the loop. Uh, the percentage of human in the loop varies depending on the task. So sometimes it can be one to two percent because you are doing simple picking and they only come in when picking is not done. Uh, in in more complicated tasks, it can be slightly longer. So how much like training time is required for a person to use this app? So what we found, at least in our user studies, that you can actually get to expert level performance in about fifteen minutes or so. And that is. I'm guessing task dependent also. Yes, so things like simple folding cloth, uh, pick and place is easy. Uh, dexterous assembly is slightly harder. Uh, but I think this is another thing, one of those things where once you start deploying, you will start doing these sort of tiered users, right? Where you are uh, like, think mechanical Turk, you only get matched to this task, task level N only give, is given to player level N, uh, not player, like beginners will not get hard tasks. How do you control the quality of this? Because you know, Amazon Turk, right, is very cheap, but uh, quality is pretty like, bad. Yeah. yeah, like why scale dot AI, those kind of companies is very successful because you know they control the quality, right? But so but this kind of cloud source. We thought about this, we have not implemented this. Uh, so we the framework is basically um, uh, so we have algorithmic mechanisms to evaluate data that you've collected. Right. And then what we can do is after you do like Level up only happens when the data that you have collected can actually be used for training. If it is not, then, then you go back and we can give you that feedback fairly quickly. In fact, let me show you, right? So uh, uh, the question was, as you pointed out, right? Data can be collected, but can, any, can anything meaningful be done with the data, right? Otherwise, what's the point? Uh, we, are, we are always stuck in the loop of collecting data, right? So, that framework is basically offline setup where you have large data sets, but you still have to do policy learning with fixed RL uh, without interaction. You can do evaluation of the policy, but you cannot do learning with interaction. So that would be the offline RL setup. Now, again, people would argue offline RL, isn't it working? Don't we see like 20 other papers uh, every conference? Turns out not really, right? If you really think about this, most of the papers are primarily on simple locomotion or Data is collected from pre-trained RL agents, not humans. Turns out that when humans collect data, uh, the data is much more harder to learn from. Mostly 
because there are many ways to fail and many ways to succeed. So the, the kind of multimodality that the data comes in with is far too much for the current offline RL algorithms. Right? So essentially, supervised learning, if you were to do this, doesn't work out the box. So this is where we came up with a first set of algorithm, which is a structured RL algorithm, where we say, you can really think of this problem as a two-point problem. One is a planning problem, and the other one is essentially a generative model. Because the problem is multimodal, you can pose the low-level problem as think about taking a next step problem. So you're thinking, let's say, one second out. That problem can be unimodal and can be trained with large-scale data at, let's say, imitation learning, whether supervised or not. On the other hand, the generative model problem is basically selecting what goal to go to. That can be purely a generative model problem where you are doing state-to-state -state generation. There's nothing about actions. It is basically saying, think of it like this, that it's a high-level planner. It is telling you what should the next step be, not how to do that next step. Why is this the right way to do this? Why? Because generative models are very good already at capturing that multimodality. We already see that in images. We already see that in many trajectory generation. So state-to-state -state generative model can capture the multimodality of the data, which is can essentially capturing what state to go to. And you can pick that state based on some value function. You can learn that value function by saying, if this is the goal that I'm trying to, what is the value of being in this state? And then you can basically say, okay, now that I know what the goal is, local goal, I need to figure out what actions I need to take to get to that goal. This turned out to be fairly successful, actually, compared to both state-of-the-art sort of behavior cloning methods and uh, offline RL methods. We were able to solve multi-step tasks, like go, pick, place, and put, uh, without having structured reward functions. There is no structure in reward function here. There's only zero one, in a sense. Right? And, and we were able to show that you can actually do this whole thing also with images, by the way. So it's not just that you need low-level actions. You can do this purely with images without doing any sort of state estimation, where you do unsupervised, uh, image, unsupervised key point learning in images. The key points become your states, and you can do RL in that. And at the time, this was 40%. Uh, in subsequent unpublished work, we already reached about 75%. Why is that number important? The number is important because that is what you get out of the bat without ever deploying anything, right? This is the given your data in a sandbox, I can get to this far, right? This is not perfect, far from it rather. But warm starting a policy with 75% of success is very useful. So can you maybe, I mean, I, I saw the data like behavior for me and the BCQ, which is offline IL. Yeah. It seems to be just not working. Very bad, or like even the behavior cloning is even slightly. So if you it turns out, almost all of this is a controversial statement, and I and I I hope uh, this doesn't get publicly posted. <laughs> uh, it turns out if you have sufficient data, behavior cloning is strictly always better. Uh, almost always, there is no current offline RL method that would beat behavior cloning if you do the right data augmentation. Yeah. Uh, and your high risk, is that also kind of like some surprise learning, like you try to... Yeah, so that's what I showed, like right? So nice basically, system. it is using the data, it is using the data to do three things. Fit a generative model to do state-to-state -state prediction, fit a value function independently based on goal, and independently do behavior cloning. That that last thing, the low level thing, is basically behavior cloning. Value function here is uh, different from like the value function in IR. No, no, it is the same thing. Okay. But it's basically in but this. Do you do you need IR to learn this value? I mean, uh, you are doing offline uh, or off policy evaluation, so you don't need new data, but you still need uh, what you would call standard TD, TD error or Q learning style methods to get to that value function. So in this case, we are doing V, not Q. OK. What is the state here? Like, uh, state here is like some latent representation? Or state can be anything. State can be, like, let's say, robot state. Or as I said, we can do it with images. State can be just these abstract things, the like key point representations. OK. But does the value need to 
use IO to learn, or you can use in some like I don't know any kind of like supervised learning or so supervised learning will get you low level actions, right? If I want to use the data in a sense where let's assume, okay, let's let's assume, and I'm going to show you actually. All of your data is going from point A to point B, always, right? And then other part of the data is going from point C to point D. The task is now going from point A to point C. How would you do that? In principle, supervised learning cannot solve that. Like I can show you this because none of the data sets actually do that, right? Uh, that is what value learning will solve. Right? You can solve newer tasks. Otherwise, you'll need data for every pair of points, which is not possible. I need to have some generalization. Yes, I think Brian has a question. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so what, why is using images always better than states? What, what information is missed in... Ah, in this particular case, it just so happened that images were a bit more generalized than, um, uh, than the states because they captured the object slightly better. I think this is our hypothesis uh, uh, in, in our key point style model. Uh, the key point model was not particularly built for this paper. In fact, it was built for a completely different use case. Uh, it just we just thought that like after the fact. In, in fact, we tried the image thing after the paper was accepted, independently as a as a uh, as just a curiosity result. Uh, and and it turns out that it was uh, stronger than when we were using low level states, mostly because low level states have a lot of jitter, high dimensional jitter, while key points in images did not have the same amount of jitter and key points were all 2D. So I think uh, the, the model that was doing essentially image to key point prediction had implicitly learned a filtered state representation model in a sense. I'm not saying that it is, it is only to give you intuition. It's hand wavy. Uh, but the interesting thing is all of these key points are essentially learned in an unsupervised manner. So we're not like providing any, uh, any supervision for key points. Okay, I see. This is uh, this so is the, our so the object, to explain this. Yeah. So the object states here doesn't it is like like a lower quality object states states or could you say that? Uh, the the object states here it's it's like uh, some low quality states or or what? What is state here? It is those little seven key points, two deep, two deep uh, x y positions of the seven key points, mm -hmm. uh, concatenated in order. That's it. So maybe just state representation is rich enough. That. That's what I'm trying to say, right? It's both rich and filtered, so it's stable. It's not jittery enough, right? When you do this in like, let's say, uh, the seven-dimensional robot arm plus the sixth off pose of the object, it's slightly jittery, and and that jitter causes maybe. Oh, uh, I see. Like we are not doing explicit filtering. So I think that's the implicit thing that is happening. Gotcha. I see. Thanks. First of all, I would like to thank all of you to make this uh, uh, interactive, which also means that I'll not go all over, through all of the material. But, but however much material we go through, hopefully it would be interesting. So the next question we were asking is, OK, what I've shown you so far is you can collect data. I've shown you that maybe if you do an uh, interesting framework of generative model plus imitation learning, you can learn from that data. But another question is, well, can we use this data even more efficiently? Is there more juice in the data? Uh, so again, all of this is still offline, right? So this idea was, can we do data augmentation? But data augmentation, first of all, data augmentation has helped a lot, actually. Uh, so there is an, a set of algorithms called goal relabeling, which is which has resulted in number of, let's say, successful variants of even online RL algorithms. HER is hindsight experience replay, which allows you to use the data in off-policy RL more efficiently. And then people in vision have been doing these sort of visual input relabeling by doing domain randomization in a variety of ways. And that was also shown to be very successful. But if you really noticed, a lot of this was, well, empirical insights, not algorithmic insights. Like, we tried this, it worked kind of thing, right? Uh, so so we, we went back and said, like, why? What is the unified algorithmic argument for, for when this works and when would this not work? And if we could figure this out, then maybe we can do better. And it turns out if you use the uh, lens of causality, you can explain this. Think of it like this. Goal relabeling is essentially changing the goal 
when the dynamics in the world stays the same. So state, action state remains the same, only G changes. And the fact that G and, and dynamics are independent, you can do that, independent mechanisms. Again, same goes for vision. The rendering process is independent of the underlying state and dynamics. Hence, you can change the color and nothing changes. You can take this idea that if you can learn these independent causal mechanisms, then you can do very cool things. You can learn which mechanisms are independent and you can get what I would call combinatorial generalization. Let me show you one very simple example and then we'll talk robotics. Think of this very simple pool ball example. Scenario one has blue and orange balls. Scenario two has blue and orange balls. Question for you, which of the following scenarios are possible without getting new data? You get only two data points and you have to tell me which of them are valid. Is this valid or not? One could argue it is valid because think of the blue and the orange ball. You can take them from two different environments and put them together and it'll still work. They're not interacting. Right. Is this valid? Physically, this is invalid because this could result in a co uh, collision that I do not have data to prove yes or no. I do not know what happens. So given only two data points, I don't know what will happen. If I can identify these kind of situations, then I can augment the data with the one at the bottom because it's possibly valid. Same things in happening in robotics. Think about a manual robot. If the two arms are working simultaneously but never interacting, I can do a task where they even come up into the same workspace but independently. This is a valid data point. But when they do handover, it's not a valid data point because, well, dynamics interaction, I don't know what, ha what will happen. So the question was, how can I learn this underlying model in a model-free sense? I'm not like explicitly doing this. And I only need to do local causality, not global causality. Globally, everything is tied together. What is local causality? Local causality can basically mean if you are far enough apart in space and time, then local dynamics is independent. What is far enough apart? You can come up with your own thresholds. How do we do this? One very simple way to do this is using simple transformer style models to fit sequence to sequence dynamics. One simple example is, let me show you. All right. uh, think of very simple example, the ball and ball. Right. If I can learn some local linear dynamics model, then I can show that they are independent if the dynamics model is block diagonal. Right. So orange ball affects orange ball, blue ball affects only blue ball. If they're locally diagonal or not interacting enough, then I can basically even turn off the orange ball and blue ball will still exist in the environment. This allows me to create new data points. How does this help? Well, in simple robot tasks, where you're just pushing a block to an environment, adding new data with counterfactual data augmentation, what I just showed you, allows me to reach 2x performance in half the data. Now, this might not be impressive enough. Why? Because the x-axis is simple. It's only about 300,000 steps. At this point, it's not very interesting. Make the task hard, the performance argument remains. Suddenly, notice that the x-axis is 30x longer. So now, if the cost of data is even, let's say, minuscule at that scale, the 2x improvement starts becoming very big, uh, very easily. Like, so what I'm telling you is, if you can do counterfactual data augmentation, you can do a lot. Figuring out how to do this correctly. So we just, quite literally yesterday, <laughs> I don't have slides for it because the paper was submitted yesterday, uh, uh, how to do this in a, so we can we have short improvements on, on this result. So CODA was published 2020, oops, and, and we have done what we call more CODA. <laughs> uh, where we can now do uh, this thing in more interesting environments, uh, including driving. Because it seems that for, for here we just do synthetic environments, augmentations. That's Actually, you can do this uh, as long as you can figure out some sort of causal relationships, you can do that. So there is a student who is working on autonomous driving data from the Waymo data set. We are basically saying that. Uh, can I do interactions? Because usually the problem in driving, at least from my understanding, and I'm not an expert in driving, is you can replay the data, but editing the data, if like this car was not there, what would the ego car do? Or what this other car would do if this ego car was not there, is the behavior modeling problem that doesn't exist. 
uh, and, and that's a very hard problem to do generally. Uh, we have been looking at that problem from a causal perspective, like arguing that uh, every car has a causal model, locally causal model. So what happens three streets away from you doesn't really affect your local driving here. So I can do a lot of things in that space where as soon as I can figure out what is interacting and what is not and what sort of effects have long, long distance and short distance uh, effects, then I can do data augmentation from among my data set. And then training these behavior models can be a bit more robust. Uh, this is work in progress. So I don't have much results to show, but I'm happy to chat more. And so here, like you were just saying, Coda is using some augmentation, data augmentation. To... Yeah, but we use data that you have seen, then learn the underlying causal model, then use that causal model to add more data. So data augmentation is based on causal model that is learned simultaneously. Okay. Is there a paper? How yes, yes, mean? yes. Okay. Coda is a new. So, so far, I think we are like at five minutes before 11. I want to show you, right? So, we talked about just one aspect of this thing, which was basically just where is the data coming from? By the way, these kind of issues of structure appear in all sorts of problems, right? When you do Q learning, is MLP sufficient or do you do other kinds of models? This is yet another paper we found that. One, if you use different architectures in your RL model, Q functions and, and policy functions, you can actually do much better. Dense connections like ResNets help a lot, right? Another paper we showed that uh, so far we have been assuming magically that Q function is this godsend. This is how we define Q learning. But why? Why are we limited to to this? We showed that. Instead of doing Q function, you do time aware Q function, which is called accessibility. So time aware in the sense, H is horizon. Think of it like this, that Q function is basically a value function that is not, that is essentially assuming that time is not a problem. I can solve this problem however long it takes. But in practical problems in robotics, time is a problem. Right? If, if, uh, if I'm given five seconds to solve the problem versus five minutes, the solution could actually be very different. Risk comes into play, right? Uh, so time aware decision making can be done and you can learn much better decisions, or much better value functions with this. We call that algorithm C learning. This was a paper last year at ICLA. Right? Then if you just look at, this was the off policy RL part. Let's go back. Uh, I think what I want to show you is could have shown you more model-based stuff, but I think we'll run out of time. So let me skip one of these papers and talk about a more interesting paper that happened this year. So what, I'm, what I've skipped, don't worry about for now, happy to chat more. When we do model learning, we assume that model can be learned purely with offline kind of setting, and often the objective is prediction. If I have data and I can predict the data that I have, then my model must be good. Is that the right objective? Is that even sufficient? What should the learning objective be? Uh, what we have, and this paper was published, I think, not too long ago at iClear, we argued that prediction accuracy is actually not a good objective. There is an objective mismatch problem. If you are predicting everything in the state, there are things that could be important and there are things that are in, irrelevant. Maybe the irrelevant things have very complicated dynamics, like a cloud in the sky. Do I need to care about how it evolves in time? Probably not, right? It doesn't affect my driving. So if I just do model fitting with everything in the state, I can have a lot of errors. So we formalize this problem, right? So compute now the problem is you will form, you can create your model and then you can train your value function with your model. Your model as a dynamic system will show up in this framework, right? It has to because that's how you compute your value function, right? So value p, p and p hat are true model versus estimated model, right? Now, if your prediction model is off in certain dimensions of the state space, then your value would be very, very off. 
in those parts. Let me show you a very simple example. Why? Why very simple? Because it's easy to show you like the true value function. So this is a very simple value function for uh, a pendulum. Right? So this is true value function, ground truth. Now, this is what happens when I can learn this purely with, uh, let's say, simple deep RL kind of methods. What you learn, what you see is that value function overall looks very good. But if you if you see because of the way data is collected, there are these like very sharp gradient points. And notice this is a very simple problem, right? Where we know even the ground truth value function. Now, if I do MSE, which is basically just fitting error, then this is what you get. The fitting error is basically saying that I've, at every point of time, uh, I don't care about the task that I'm going to do with the model. The model needs to be correct everywhere. Now, in simple environments, that's possible, but in, in hard environments, it's not, right? So this is a technical problem. How do I do this? Where, how do I make my model learning objective task aware? Because I only care about my model in certain places, not about in other places, right? If I'm doing driving in California, do I really care about my car skidding? Uh, <laughs> uh, so then we came up with a mechanism where it's best of both worlds. You can change the objective to be weighted by value. Now you might argue, what value? Well, value we don't have, right? Because if you had the value by bother about training a model, you're done, right? Uh, so you're doing simultaneous value estimation and model fitting. And you're basically, in a sense, arguing that model needs to be correct in places where the gradient of the value function is high, because that is where uncertainty will cost me a lot. If the gradient, if the value function is flat, let's say zero, then whether a model is correct or not, I don't care because it's like, not a bad, useful state to begin with. This allows us to actually do sort of better gradient fitting for both value function and model learning. I'll, I'll spare you the details because we are out of time, but I'll show you some very simple results. So what we show, what we did was we took a model and we took one of these like simple environments which everybody shows in RL. But the only thing we did was we restricted the model size. Right. So if I restrict the model size, so this is basically doing RL in standard model where the model size is not really restricted. Right. So original model, same four hidden layers, standard stuff. Right. Now, as soon as I ask the model to do something where the model size might be restricted, it turns out that MLE style models start not working very easily. Now, this is not to show that, oh, models should always be smaller in this case. This is to show you that for realistic problems, model size is almost always uh, not enough. Right? We also did another result where, where the, the lower it goes, the worse it becomes. One thing that is not here is in realistic environments, it's not just the reduction in model size. Uh, if you have dimensions of the state space that you're not modeling, let's say often what happens is Images input 100 dimensions, only two of them matter, but you don't know which two of them. So then how do you do this? Again, value aware model allows you to figure out which two dimensions will matter. And then those are the only things that you should optimize for. It's allowing, it's basically saying you can do MLE, but only in certain dimensions. You need to rescale the losses across dimensions. Okay, so we are at 11 o'clock. I do want to show you this, like this is an overview, right? So we talked about transition model. It's, but the structure is not limited to transition models. Like I can have the same structure in how should you do even your state representation learning to do better RL. We've shown that multimodal state representations that are trained not end to end because end to end training can be very expensive, but in a sense, be aware of multimodality then this can result in real robot reinforcement learning. So this is a result where we train purely on real robot, never use the simulation because well, simulation for tactile robotics is very hard, but the whole thing can be trained in two hours without supervision because we are using very good input representations. Why? If you really think about deep learning, majority of your parameters actually go in perception, not in the deep RL part. Maybe like 5% of the parameters are in the RL part. Majority of this goes here. So learning good representations in a self supervision helps. Same thing happens on the output space. If you can use a good output space, then search is very easy. 
in, in robot learning, we have shown that variable space impedance control, which is basically saying thinking of the right task space allows you to do again, real world robot learning, which transfers without doing any of the fancy sim to real transfer learning domain randomization. So here, what you see is an agent that is trained purely on simulation. The agent sees the image in inset. The task is to clean up the table. You put the robot, put this policy on the table on, on the real robot. We are not doing any sort of magic here. The table height is not even given. Actually, it's a standing desk that you can put up and down. And because the robot is compliant and this compliance is learned. So we are changing the action space for the RL to make the whole system more, what you would say, efficient because the search space is easier and transfer learning is free. Right? If you do that, you can also do better teleoperation. In this case, we learn this action space rather than specify it manually. Right? So this decoder can actually be learned. So in this case, you can say that uh, a person can control a high dimensional robot with just a joystick. And it's not just like a joystick where you have mapped control. This, this decoder is learned. This idea also works on, on legged robots. Same idea. This time around, the action space is what is called centroidal action space, where you only control Let's assume it's a flying torso. Uh, it allows you for much simpler RL, and then we can solve for it using optimal control. So I think this is a good point to stop. I'm happy to chat more. I prepared for more, but I think this is a good point to stop. If there's one thing that you take away from today's talk is this. It turns out that when you do reinforcement learning, don't just think about how to do better Q function learning, which has been the focus of most of the RL work. There's a lot that is on the table in terms of how to get better data, how to use more data efficiently, what model architectures to use. Do you want to use the value function in the way Bellman error is defined or are there better utility functions? Right? Are there good state encoders? Are there good action encoders? Structure or inductive biases in RL has a long way to go. We are far from having even optimal or near optimal solutions. In the same way, we are seeing that general purpose inductive biases like transformers can be very useful. We have not yet discovered what would be the transformer in RL. And I don't think transformer is the transformer in RL. <laughs> uh, but there is value for or value in discovering uh, what that representation might be. I think this is a good place to stop. I have a bunch of interesting results that I have prepared for, but uh, but I think this is a good point to for me to answer questions. I would like to thank a lot of the work that I do is because of the wonderful colleagues and the students I get to work with. I am very lucky to have access to their expertise. Uh, and I would like to thank you for uh, the privilege of your time. Uh, for me to be able to talk about all of this work that I'm very excited about. I, as I said, we do a bunch of work. I only talked about a very small fraction today. Uh, this is not even all the work. This is mostly just the work that has happened in the last maybe 18 months or so. Uh, the group is fairly broad uh, and works on a variety of problems. Uh, uh, Alexander had asked me primarily to focus things on, on RL, so I, I tried to sort of stay on point. <laughs> Uh, but happy to chat about basically everything and anything uh, on the table. Thanks. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. It's Eric Smyre, right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Any questions? Okay. If you don't ask questions, then I'll feel that nobody got anything out of it. <laughs> Can you please maybe share a little bit more information about Sim to Real, for example, your way you just said that we are learning the new. Uh, transfer function for new actions space. How it's been done? It's it's, it's learned uh, before we are going to the new environment, or it is just learned on the fly in the new environment. So we have algorithms for both. Mm -hmm. We started with before sort of thing. Like so, first question was first of all, generic question to ask was, okay, let me give you context. We do very practical research rather than open-ended research. So we started like okay. This whole RL business is not working on real robots. What do we need to do? Let's think about like if we were real robots, this is what we would do. 
we went back to the table and said, okay, if we are if we are planning to deploy it on a real robot, I'm not going to deploy a policy that is directly controlling my uh, my low level torques. It's dangerous for the robot. It, it it's just a hard action space. Let's think about an action space that is used in robot control generally. And this action space is called end effector control. Basically, think of it like this: if the robot is seven dimensional, but you think of the robot only as the gripper and sixed off, right? So it's basically a disembodied point robot. So this this space is called operational space control. Uh, and and of course, this idea is not limited to manipulators. The same thing works on cars. The same thing works on on uh, walking robots. So we said, okay. Operational space control is a good task space. Let's try to train policies in that. We found that it worked very well. Then we said, okay, operational space control is essentially impedance control. Uh, you can do that for cars. I can give you an example. So when you are doing impedance control for cars, impedance would mean distance to go, distance to collisions, right? So a controller where it says the barrier functions become harder and harder the closer you get to the obstacle, kind of thing, right? And you can tune that barrier function. So now we gave that tuning knob directly to the RL agent. So the agent is tuning when to be stiff and when to be soft. What collisions can you make and what collisions can you not make? So let me give you an example. If I have to wipe a table, right? In the Z axis, it should be stiff, right? It should always keep the pressure and pressure on. But in the X, Y axis, it should basically be fluid. Like in essentially like frictionless. So it's and it's dynamic because during the reach phase of the task, it's a different set of what you would call impedance values or PID controller values. At the, in this phase of the task, it's a different PID set of controller values. Uh, currently, if you look at robotics in the industry, they manually tune these things. And in this case, we gave the policy this ability to decide what the stiffness is in what part of the task based on the agent. So this is why it was interesting that we were doing variable stiffness operational space control. Then we said, okay, for robots, we knew the answer. That's why we were able to do this. For many environments, we don't know the answer. So that is where we actually uh, wrote a paper last year, which was ICRA paper, where we learned this action space. It would not always be variable stiffness. It could be other, other dimensions. So we, we set, a, set this up as an encoder decoder model, but this time around, we are not encoding states, we are encoding actions. And we are basically arguing that you're learning a new latent action space, which should have certain properties, properties of consistency, properties of uh, smoothness. Uh, but if those properties are satisfied, which we can by doing smoothness in latent space, then we have learned a new action space, which can be lower or higher dimensional, right? Which can control uh, let's say more complicated action spaces. Let me give you a very simple example of thinking about this. When you play video games, I don't know if you play or how many of you play video games, maybe some of you do. Uh, the controller that these people give you is actually not directly mapped. In fact, when you think about this, it's not even like cognitively simple. You are using something that is maybe a 2D joystick, a few buttons, right? So it says like a character moves in 3D space with only a 2D joystick, maybe a button to kick, a button to jump. But even with that low dimensional space, the game that you play feels very realistic. Why? Because they adapt the jump based on the environment. So they only ask you when to jump. They don't need to worry about like how the jump needs to be. Right? So you are still in cognitive control of the character without needing to control the low level details of the character's joints. It's the same exact example here that if the interface allows you to do cognitive control without worrying about the low level details of where the, where the collision is, where to apply force, where not to apply force, how much force to apply, then this whole teleoperation becomes much more cognitively easy. The agent will not still not do anything without your, your being in control. For example, if you're playing FIFA, there is no way it will score a goal without you being at the controller. But uh, you're not controlling the agent literally at the lowest level of, let's say, animation. So now think of this in the context of, let's say, navigation. I can control multiple cars, a fleet of cars with a single robot, a shared autonomy kind of system. I can control the same car. Uh, I can control multiple cars at an intersection with a single interface. Right? 
uh, again, learned systems. For robots, I can do multiple arms, but a single input space. And I, I don't have to switch one arm to one arm in, in stable, but I can basically operate in a space. So one of the things that we are building is, for example, when you're doing teleoperation, you should not really even need to think about the robot. Why think about the robot? Because the robot is not the point of interest. If I'm interested in maybe, I don't know, I'm just going to use these props. If I'm interested in this, then I should directly control the pose of this object. Right? Forget about the, the robot arm and everything. That should be like, from a controller's perspective, it's solved, magic. So this is what we already have. So now this is, of course, these are unpublished results. What we can do is, once the object is grabbed, the input directly maps to the sixth of, of the object, not the hand. So if I basically move this, there is an underlying controller or a policy that will figure out what the robot needs to do. So the user will only give you reference for the pose of this object. And then the robot will figure out through an online planner and a policy what it needs to do for the object to be in that pose. So then you can do, like if I'm interested in doing complex tasks like, like pouring, then I'm only thinking about two objects, pouring. Right? And then it also makes my task easy because it doesn't matter whether I have a KUKA or a Franka or a Company X robot. I don't care. It's their underlying control. Uh, so, so these kind of things can actually be learned. And How, it, how fast can yeah, they get to uh, I think it's because that process of learning is offline, it doesn't matter. So if I'm interested in building these controllers for particular games, there will be no general controller because why would there be? Uh, because what I'm showing you is essentially information compression. Yes. So I information compression will not have, like, if it were all tasks, then the answer would be robot. It's usually these sort of compression exist because there are task spaces which don't need full full dimensions of the robot. So, uh, but you can do that offline. So speed is not usually a problem. It's you, the right question to be asking in this space is how much data do you need? What kind of data do you need? How will that data come to? Uh, uh, if you need experts to collect that data, then this defeats the purpose. So I think these are the kinds of questions we are asking. I don't have the right answer. In the paper, we collected data with pre-trained policies. Uh, one way to like, practically think about this, because you were asking is, practically the way I think about this is, I would start with low-level control in teleop. With some data, I can bootstrap and allow sh shared autonomy in version two of the system and in version three and, and so on and so forth. So practically you can bootstrap from your own data. So I just have a question. So a lot of what you just said kind of ties back to the whole state learning part that you initially talked about right? and that being okay. easy. Um, and as the other thing that I want to touch base upon was like data, the data augmentation part that you talked about in your Mokora, uh, that's super interesting, but I'm just wondering if like that could also be adapted to things like object detection and images where you could do so similar... Uh, People have already shown that, actually. It's not our work. We, we were only focusing on RL. So there is a interesting paper by Gal Chechik, ICML. I think it was an ICML best paper 2020, 2021, I forget the name, where they used this kind of causal mechanisms for both detection, augmentation, and improved classification. For example, cauliflowers are always white. Uh, but would my system be able to detect purple cauliflowers? They do exist, it's just rare. Right? Uh, so in principle, it can be done. But that would need... Magic is... There is no magic. The problem is you need to figure out some, some sort of disentanglement. Right? If you can figure out that, uh, that faces are faces not because of the color of your skin, but because of the shape of the face. Yeah, the disentanglement is the challenge for yes. the documentation part. Right? Yes, so now I would argue that, so I, I did work on some sort of, let's say, unsupervised or very like partially supervised disentanglement. I think there is an ICML paper we did this, where we argued that you can learn, unsupervised disentanglement is not a thing, mostly because you can do disentanglement, it's just that the latent dimensions you will learn will not be aligned with anything semantic. Right? How would we? Like, you, like one, one good like linear algebra argument is, for any given space, I can find many basic functions. Right? And all of them are equal, in a sense. Right? Who is to say, like, I can rotate any basis function right, in a linear space? When you use the word semantics, 
you are arguing that some of those dimensions are aligned with something that you understand, right? So it's basically saying that if I'm giving you eigenvectors of a space, and there is no unique eigenvectors of any given space, right? Some of those eigenvectors are aligned with these axes. That's what you're saying. So which means that you still need to provide some supervision yeah. to align those dimensions to your semantics. So we were able to show that you can do disentanglement unsupervised fairly well. It's just like not meaningful uh, uh, because the the spaces are not semantically disaligned. So then as long as you can provide even let's say on a hundred thousand image data set, a hundred examples, like 0.1% of the data set is labeled, then you can get unsupervised disentanglement. Right? So that was one thing. This is already two years ago, I think, at this point. I simul 2020, I believe. So far, now we are also working on slot attention style ideas where it's purely unsupervised. There is a paper this year. Uh, so object-oriented disentanglement, we can show that already works. So for example, if you have spatio-temporal data, let's say, um, I think there's a student who's already shown this on Kitty or other places where uh, if you have object-oriented data that is spatial temple, let's say videos of a camera flying through or objects moving with a fixed camera, then you can do object-oriented disentanglement. Uh, if your data set, usually the underlying assumption when you do unsupervised disentanglement is also, by the way, formally, if you look at this from a causality perspective, there's this concept of what is called unknown interventions, which basically means that, okay, let me give you a very simple example. I give you a lot of data of two types. There is a red ball and a green ball. The red ball is made of rubber, so every time I drop the ball, the ball bounces. Right? And the green ball uh, is, let's say, made of metal, and, and I, every time I drop the ball, it thuds into the space. Right? And, and all of your data is always like this. There is never a rubber red green ball and a metal red ball then there is no way for you to learn that green and metal are two separate things right why would you right so usually there is an implicit assumption that the data is what is called unknown interventions you don't tell me but the data has data points where there is a green rubber ball if there is no green rubber ball you're it's like arguing that if all of your data comes from earth you're not not going to discover gravity <laughs> Same thing happens in medical. Research. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, so these are implicit underlying assumptions on the data sets that, like, I think this is more like, uh, unless you have some domain specific knowledge, you're not going to discover this disentanglement. The question is, is that sufficient for you? Uh, uh, for, for different domain expertise? It may be, it may not be. Uh, so we are working on these things. I think there is going to be an ICML paper that is, or at least ICML workshop paper, I think that's submitted next week or something, where we are arguing that unsupervised learning can go a long way if data is collected correctly. Or you will need domain expertise. Like, I think, I keep repeating the same thing, there is no free lunch. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I have one question. So, um, so like, you know, say, for example, for the self-driving car case, like we want to use ML for driving. Of course. Um, and, you know, like there's like behavior cloning, that may be like offline RL, that may be RL. In your opinion, like, you know. What should you do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. also, I like you previously mentioned that, you know, uh, for same to real, like my own thing, you were arguing that RL should operate on some high-level uh, abstract action space, right? Like the low-level control or how you, you know, how you do things that just leads to some traditional and that is like already being solved and then I just uh, do some of this very high level. Yeah, I think domain expertise goes a very long way. This is something that we have learned practically. I think uh, like unsupervised ML is a very interesting and I would even argue very important direction, but it doesn't immediately bring value. Uh, okay, to answer your question, uh, excuse me if I say something that is completely uh, bad. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, it could be. Uh, I'm no expert in driving. I, I, I'm not going to claim, it, claim that either. If I were given that problem, first of all, I would work on state representations. Uh, 
so I'm already working on state representations in a sense, both unsupervised and supervised. Unsupervised state representation would do for a car, for example. I always give this example to my students. For a car, understanding that the door on the coffee shop on the sidewalk has a handle is not meaningful. So if I were to run current semantic segmentation things and it gives me a handle and a coffee cup, it's meaningless because there is no decision that I have to make where knowing that that is an object exists or even like a car, like a car on the side of the street has a handle, who cares? Right? For me to drive, that handle object has no meaning because the whole thing is an obstacle. Maybe that the car, other cars have a door is useful because the door can open, it can begin become an additional obstacle. So state representation learning is an important thing. Whether you do pure semantic segmentation or unsupervised or supervised, that's something to do. The problem with supervised segmentation is you are assuming that you know what the states, what all objects you need to come up with in that list and there's nothing else that I would ever need. Practically what I would do is, this thing has worked well for us, is this is thing where like you can define 20 classes and then I can do some open slots. So there are things that I know and then there are things that I don't know. I'm just giving slack to my model to learn those things that I don't know. Okay, that's option one. So do you mean like try to extract information from the sensor data and like do some? No, so this is basically saying that I'm building a classifier, let's say a slot attention based classifier or segmentation model where I'm saying that the segmentation model has 20 output potential classes. These are the 20 things, but it's not just these 20 things. There are also like class X, class Y and class C, which are basically catch all, right? Okay. Uh, uh, things that I could not have thought of. So that's the state representation. argument. Then depending on my data set size, I will work on behavior cloning first. As I said, if you have large enough data, uh, well-tuned behavior cloning models will go very long way, surprisingly long way. That requires the right data augmentation though. If you just have the right data, uh, not the right data, but very dense data, you might have uh, issues in generalization very easily. So data augmentation matters. So that's number two to your problem. Like, would I try offline RL first or behavior cloning? I would argue behavior cloning. Uh, behavior cloning only has an issue for like, uh, you know, the, um, auto yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm saying that the out of distribution thing can be fixed with the correct data augmentation. Right. Uh, so that's number two. Now, coming back to number three, which was basically, OK, would I put this directly on transfer? Like, how would transfer work uh, now? So transfer depends on the domain. Uh, this is the part where I know the least about autonomous domain. My understanding is transfer is very hard because of perception, not because of dynamics at least in, in city scale autonomous driving. Yeah, if you were doing more sort of off-roading, that's a different thing. But in city style thing, you don't assume that the car is going to be slipping or rain doesn't really change the dynamics very much. It's the perception that changes. Or, or there is a distributional change of objects. For example, if you're driving in Palo Alto downtown versus San Francisco downtown versus Venice downtown, or, uh, well, Venice is not driving, but you get the point. <laughs> uh, 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 the distribution of objects will be different, uh, right? Maybe some places do streets. Maybe, uh, maybe because of the culture difference, uh, jaywalking in Palo Alto is something that is looked down upon. So people would not jaywalk. But if you suddenly went to New York, the same the same person would actually be expected to jaywalk, right? So the model of expectation will change. So, so that is a, what you would call a distributional shift of objects and their behavior rather than, so it's a perception problem rather than, uh, rather than just a behavior cloning problem. That is where I would say generative modeling would be a very good solution. I'm sure a lot of you are already working on it. Uh, it would be stupid of me to think that that is not the case. Even within that space, there's a number of interesting things you can do that I can say from an external perspective, uh, are appearing. Causality is something that I would argue is very useful. It's not just like a purely academic concept. There are variants of, of these things that you can practically use like today. Uh, uh, you don't have to do full on causal discovery. You could just say that I am using a causal prior. That's fair game, right? Uh, I'm interested in solving a problem. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that I think would help. Uh, this causal prior would also be very useful for data augmentation to begin with. 
for training your behavior cloning model. So you want to be able to train on not arbitrary data sets that you are just adding what you would call randomization to. So I'm not going to randomly put a, a, put a pedestrian on a 60 kilometer uh, per hour highway. Why? Because not only it's unlikely, it's very unlikely, but, but more practical things uh, are more useful. This is one. Another paper that I didn't get to talk about is called S4R, which is basically, we, we named it surprisingly simple uh, things, which is basically saying a problem that appears in autonomous driving much more than in other domains. Uh, I was talking to, I think, Andre, uh, uh, he was also describing this. Uh, I think they also described this in the AI day last year. In driving, from my understanding, it, the problem is you cannot ahead of time figure out the long tail. There's just no way to do this. I do. And, and that's fair game. What you just don't want to do is if you figure out and if you encounter an error of new kind, you just don't want to make that error again. So you, you don't have a lot of data for this kind of error. So you cannot just train supervised in that sense. So what you need to do is you need to be able to say, OK, this is a corner case. I want to simulate in the neighborhood of this corner case all of the possible things that I can do with my behavior models. Train my model, update my model. Now this error, like my model will still fail. It's just that this one will not be the failure. Like it will be a new kind of failure. Right? And, and that is how you capture long tail. You cannot capture long tail. Like it would not be a problem of long tail if you could solve it uh, ahead of time without seeing the data. Right? So, so I think that is how law works, by the way. <laughs> Where, they make a law, it doesn't work, someone finds a, a loophole, then they fix it, and then they fix it again. Uh, but the only thing is that you should not need a lot of data for fixing it. Uh, and I feel among all of the problems in, in, in autonomous driving from a machine learning perspective, that is one of the very interesting problems, uh, where you want to do augmentation of rare use cases, or, or sort of rare cases. And a lot of people, from my, again, outside perspective, are building simulators to do exactly that. Tesla is doing that. I think Raquel's startup, uh, Wabi, is attempting to do exactly that. I'm sure uh, you might have internal teams attempting to do that as well. I don't know what simulator or what framework I'm using, but it must be something. <laughs> they like using IL for solving those ads. Oh, no, no. This is more like figuring out what the right mechanism of behavior modeling needs to be to do data augmentation in neighborhood of certain events. So for example, if there is this certain black swan event of, uh, of a mud cart right around the corner, that doesn't often happen, but happened this time without a sign. Let's just say that, right? So then what should you do? Maybe you should simulate five seconds beforehand, uh, add new agents and characters to simulate in the neighborhood of that event. Uh, and when I use the word neighborhood, it's a spatial temporal neighborhood, right? Uh, and, and you use your behavior models to add new data so that that event uh, is not a failure mode anymore. And, and of course, that is one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it, like an automatic pipeline would be, how do you make that process automatic to begin with? Like, how do I discover rare events automatically? And then how do I augment them automatically? And I think those are interesting questions. I have a question. In fact, um, the data from Brian, the data augmentation of interaction data was interesting. How do we do quality control in the augmented data? Good question. Uh, we have had multiple papers on this. Short answer is this, I don't know. Uh, there is a longer answer, which is more technical. Uh, this is in fact very connected to what you saw what you so, about causal prior. Yes. So, there are two practical things that we have observed. Intuition would tell you that when you do data augmentation, all of the augmented data should also be real. Right? It's like otherwise the data augment, augmented data will not act the model. That is usually the what you would say the intuition. That was the S4RL paper, which says, no, that's not true. Uh, S4RL says even random perturbations of certain kinds in offline RL and BC are surprisingly effective. Basically, when you do random perturbations around points, it's not necessary that every new data point is even physically viable. You are just doing jitter. That was as per RL paper. 
And then all of this Coda business is basically saying that we can do out of distribution data. So the argument, like the strategy that I have for practical use cases is this. You should do random perturbations locally of the data that you've seen. It doesn't have to be physically available. And then you can generate out of distribution data with causal models. Uh, so compositional generalization can be achieved through causality. Uh, easier strategies like simple uniform randomization plus behavior cloning uh, work surprisingly well. Not just our own papers, by the way. I should say this, right? This is something that like the community is figuring out. There is a cool paper called RoboMimic. You guys could, should check it out. It is by collaborators. I was not part of it. RoboMimic. And, and all they showed was a well-tuned behavior cloning agent with very good state space beats everything hands down. Everything. You just need the right data augmentation. Right? So uh, from a practical perspective, it tells you a sad story. The sad story is in the last six years or so, a bunch of offline RL papers have come out. It's just that all of them are useless. <laughs> But how about the online RL or? Online RL, that's a good point. So online RL is only useful if your simulator is useful. I'm assuming you're not doing online RL on the car. <laughs> right. So if your simulator, if you, basically the argument is, if you have a reasonable enough dynamics model that you can trust, then yes, of course you should use it. Why not? Yeah, the question is like maybe like building the dynamics model is it a more challenging problem than just a learning policy? Uh, I would argue. Like I would argue. Dynamics model is like to you know predict uh, you know what. I think happen. it's it may be challenging or not, but it's something that you cannot sidestep. Like it's something that if you go to behavior policy directly, right? Then how would like there is no way to do generalization to auto distribution problems. Like what? How would you do this practically in an algorithmic fashion? Uh, so let's assume there are two paradigms of solving this problem. Right? You have a lot of data, let's assume that. And you also have a very good simulator. But it's a simulator nonetheless. The distributions don't match. Let's just say that, right? which is a practical problem. Now, there are two ways to attempt the problem. One way to say this, let's do end-to-end -end learning some, with some definition of end-to-end. -end. I'm not saying like image to cloud kind of thing, but some definition of end-to-end, -end, no modeling. Right? So I'm just doing this. Uh, whether you're doing supervised learning, RL, or whatever. Now, the problem is generalization in that space is very tricky. Uh, you can do end-to-end -end learning, uh, but the sort of rare event generalization is very hard. Now, model-based RL or models, learning models, or either of the reward function or the dynamics, allow you to do structured data augmentation or even just structured environment generation that you can do policy learning in. Uh, for for these kind of cases. So I would argue learning a model is not, like not learning a model is not an option. Not learning a model is not, not an option. Okay. You have to. I, I would like be very surprised if you can do it otherwise. Uh, like model free one. No, 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 no. I think I'm, I'm, the final solution can be model free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? It's just that how you arrive at that model free solution will not be model free. <laughs> right? So one example that we do, again, it was an iClear paper this year, is you learn a model, then you essentially distill that model into a policy. That's that right. paper was called SHAC, like Accelerated Differentiable uh, mo uh, Model Learning. In this case, when you do model-based RL, you don't do model-based RL in the sense of, so when we talk about model-based RL, one way to do model-based RL is, I take a model and I use it in the planner life. Right? I use rollouts of that model and then do evaluation because the model is stochastic. That is one way to do this, like online planning. Another way is basically what is called, you can really think amortized model in the sense that I use the model for value learning. So when I do value function learning, what do I do? I basically say V is equals to or Q equals to reward, let's say step one, step two, step three, so n step rollout plus future value function, which is basically the bootstrap, right? That rollout right now, how does it come through? 
in if you're doing online rl you actually roll out that model and compute that thing based on the rollout in the environment but in model based rl you can basically do rollouts in your model so it's imagined rollouts in a sense and in that setup eventually you get an end to end policy at inference time you don't need model right so you have essentially distilled everything you know into an end to end direct policy but you arrived at that using a model so algorithmically what you do is there will be a loop where collect data fit model use fitted model to fit value function use value function to use get policy and then use policy to get more data and then iterate so you use model as an intermediate object yeah you like the dreamer v2 or like what dream, dreamer is a good example but there are other algorithms yeah. uh, this is more of a i don't think dreamer invented this like ideally this thing is called dyna 1989 mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but there are many variants of this implementation uh, like how do you do the model what should the model architecture be what should the policy architecture be how long do you do rollouts is the model differentiable if it is differentiable then are you using those gradients so all of those result in what you would call different algorithms but the big picture loop remains the same right like get data fit a model use model so this formally i think if you search for it is called model based policy expansion or value expansion m b uh, v e uh, and i think a very good paper for this would be i think Bre brendan amos wrote a decent paper on this i think the algorithm was called svg or svg something like that uh, uh, not that their algorithm is better than others but the paper is written well for you to understand all of this all at once rather than reading 20 papers <laughs> but i think like the question is like you know whether building this model right is it a harder problem than you just to say behavior cloning like like just to try to learn the policy so in, to me it's maybe like you know directly learning the policy is like a discriminative model like you you just like giving this input like like what what should be the output so, and then the model i understand your like question a, like a, you know you try to understand all the other people's it's a generative model right, right? so a generative is, model is a harder problem it right? seems to be a harder problem yes. yeah so okay. you know in terms of like you know there are some philosophy why right? you shouldn't solve a harder problem to solve a simple problem <laughs> yes and no uh, the error you made in that problem was you are solving a multitask problem so if your problem was to create a policy only for one instance of the task driving is not like a single task in a sense right lane change is a different task than exit than left turns so now if you were solving any one of those scenarios then learning a policy would be easier than learning a model uh, but in a sense what you are learning is technically an online mixture of experts or a combination of these policies so you are doing a multitask problem which is why this is hard so let me give you other way of around like you gave me an example right that discriminative problems in principle should be easier than generative problem through that now if i want to tell you that not only do you need to do a discriminative problem you need to do so in your setting let's say you're not doing regression let's say you're doing classification let's assume that your action space is discrete you are simultaneously learning in the same model 100 different classifiers not one classifier and not 100 classes 100 different classifiers it's equivalent to seeing fitting that in the same model you are fitting 100 functions simultaneously and they are parameterized by some character like something right? let's say which is the active policy right so mixture of experts kind of argument so you have a hyper parameter or hyper network that does this and suddenly that meta learning problem becomes harder or much harder so then then that argument of of discriminative model could actually not work because you could argue that maybe this time around the model would be the common component throughout that would allow you to do this this thing better i'm not saying that by the way in my group as well and we are trying to do this we have not agreed that practically model based methods are the only solution right now all of the other things which i described like context based rl where people have done probabilistic context based rl bayes adaptive rl 
those methods just not do not scale it. I have a paper as well, by the way. Yeah, there's a paper called Ocean. Right? It was an UAI paper, I think one or two years ago, I forget then. Uh, and from a framing perspective, it describes this exact problem, right? where you're basically solving multiple problems simultaneously. Uh, and, and that, like, which problem are you solving is given to you as context. So now, in math, all of this sounds like, oh, why? This must be possible. Uh, when you do this, it turns out it doesn't work. So let's say, let's say you are doing Q learning. So what is the Q function? Q function is QSA, right? And we know for now that learning a Q function such that the actual learned Q function is correct, uh, low variance is actually very hard. Now, what you are saying is, I'm interested in learning not just QSA, but QSA C, and C is some context variable of dimension 100. So then I'm learning a family of Q functions simultaneously that has not been solved yet uh, so maybe it can be solved and maybe it will be the right solution but for now no that that would be a lot of this is empirical advice i'm not saying that don't do it i'm just saying that i don't know how to do it <laughs> yeah. cool cool Thanks. thank you no thank you for making this discussion yeah, I think it was really useful to you know, get some insights from. Should we stop recording, I guess? Yeah. yeah. Oops. Yeah. I hope so. Oops.